Hi, everybody. This is uh, the Bob and Ray Show. Before we have our regular theme, we want to try out a new quartet that we've been working with here. Mary Magoon, Webley Webster, uh, Wally Ballou, and a good uh, Tex Blaisdell. Tex, it's good to see you again. Thank in you very much, Ray. And it's a pleasure to be back here again. Tex has been on the road with his uh, Western uh, show. Uh, you're with Bob and Ray Tour number 11, I think. 23. Uh, how did I get that 11? Well, anyway, well, we've heard good reports from you. And, we'll uh, talk uh, with you a little later, Tex. Now, if you four would group yourself... Right around this microphone Right around here. the mic there. Webley, will you come over here and Wally? Right. right. Okay. I don't have much of a singer, anyway. All right, here we go. All right, one. Way down the farthest farm in river, far, far away. I think they're a little too much presence there. I think they're, they're on mic a little bit too much. It was... Uh, it was a, a, you know, just a thought. Let's forget it for a while, huh? Let's have the regular theme. Yeah. It's better. Yes, the Bob and Ray Show from coast to coast. Bob Elliott and Ray Goulding pleased again to present the CBS Radio Network. This is going to be kind of a surprise show, except... Well, one thing we know is going to happen, and that's... Way down the pond, oh, come on, Swanee on. River. Oh, I'm not going to sing with that group. What's the matter? Are they trying to go out on their own or something? That Mary tries to drown out everybody. Well, well I don't, I don't think, think I she did that. Well, anybody anymore than anyone else. She picked the best one of us to... No, she the stands there and tries to bellow and to do... Well, we decided, we decided we wouldn't... Uh, the big ham, a... Mary, that's all. Well, I don't think you could call me a ham, really. I was just well, trying to do Mary the best I think Mary has a very sweet voice. Oh, I wanted to dry up. Well, you're a newscaster. How would you know? Well, I, I think that uh, maybe Webley misinterprets... Uh, uh, what I'm trying to do, when I sing, I sing loud, not to dominate the song, but only so to uh, do a good job. So your voice gets out there in a big, round tone. Well, I don't know. It just doesn't seem right to me. I think we'd better work on it a little bit more before we do it. Well, I more. think maybe so, too, yes. Uh, as I said... Well, will you move up to the back of the studio in any event, please, because we have a have program to do. great Bob and Ray popcorn back there. And as I said, the only thing we're sure is going to happen is. is we have a visit from Barry Campbell, who will be along in just a few uh, uh, Listen to that. Minutes. You hear the popcorn popping? Mm. Oh, that smells wonderful, doesn't it, huh? It does. And it's been a very popular feature with the audience. I know you're going to enjoy it. And there's the great Bob and Ray Bird. Yeah. They're really home. He's uh, developing uh, quite a taste for popcorn, too, the great bird. Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, Columbia Phonograph dealer in your no. neighborhood Which has... Uh, you know that one? No. Well, he has Columbia first with the LP record, first with the <clears throat> guaranteed stereo fidelity records, and now Columbia is first again with Stereo One. You know what? I'd call them number one in the wonderful world of sound. Thank you very much, audience member. You're exactly now, right. Now, can I have some popcorn? <laughs> yes. It's a new listening experience in stereophonic high-fidelity sound that makes all your records, stereo or regular, sound better. You know, I have in my home four Columbia record players, stereo and otherwise. They're the best. Four, ladies. Four, yeah. Can I wonderful. have two handfuls of popcorn? Sure. Thank you. Of course. Well, there is a Columbia Stereo One phonograph for every room and for every budget, for every listening need. Ray, I think you have the prices there, don't you? Well, the uh, Columbia Portable... Would you help me hold this up for the audience, yeah. Bob? Uh, this one, Columbia Portable, is priced as low as twenty four ninety five, And the consoles with many exclusive new Columbia features start at the amazing low price of $129.00. And ninety-five cents. Can I buy them on easy terms at my Columbia Phonograph dealer? Well, I suppose you could talk with them. I think so. Uh, but uh, go see them anyway and hear them all uh, real soon. Now it's a real treat to welcome back from a long uh, engagement on the West Coast with his orchestra, our old friend and yours too, ladies and gentlemen, star of stage, screen, television, radio, and the dance band world, Barry Campbell. Hi, Bob. <clears throat> and uh, hi again, everybody. It's Is that a new wonderful. nose you have, Barry? Yeah, I had a little hey. job. Uh, do you mind if I smoke here in the studio? No, go ahead. Well, uh, Barry 
You've got a lot to fill us in on. I know you've been on the road. We've, uh... Is that popcorn? Yeah. Boy, smells great. But go ahead. You've uh, reactivated the old Barry Campbell musical aggregation. Uh, that's right, uh, Bob. I'm trying to uh, bring back that wonderful, wonderful era of the big-name band. Oh, and, back uh, in the 40s, huh? Right. And I've noticed, of course, uh, lately that there has been uh, a plethora of uh, recordings made... That's plethora, you big idiot. Oh, wait, please. Now, uh, Barry is our guest. Let's not have any uh, reaction. Well, uh, the whether it's talks. plethora or plethora, I don't know. There have been great many records made. I think she was right. On the scene. I think you were wrong. Uh, well, I, I, I it's not important anyway. Well, what do you mean I got baggy trousers? All right. Go on, don't be They look baggy. They look baggy. Look, Mary, what? Thanks for all of them, Barbara. Cut it out, please. All right. We have a guest. Bob, I... It's okay. It doesn't bother me at all. We we noticed that there have been a great many records made. Wait a minute. Just, just yeah. a minute, Barry. Right. Right. You're very interesting. But i, I got to clear right. this up. Okay. Midget. Bob and Ray Midget. What do you want? We go over and escort them out of the studio because we can't keep our mind on what we're doing. Okay. I'll get it. All right. Come on. Thanks a lot. Do the break. Let it broadcast. All right. Now, Barry, you were saying? Uh, we've been noticing lately a great many records are made on the scene in restaurants and uh, ballrooms, and uh, they have a nice roomy sound, and they're very popular with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll mention Lester Lennon. I'll just say it. They're very popular. Sure. And uh, the Tiffany Ball, things like that. So now what I want to do is, uh, is to promote my record, if I may. I've made it down here. In, uh, you mean you made an on-the-spot record, actually, at one of your engagements? Right, right at the Joe's uh, Barn Grill and uh, Food to Go Out. Well, it doesn't sound like a very, uh, well, a ballroomy type place. Well, it's on room fif- uh, Route, I'm sorry, Route 15, uh, right outside of uh, Bergen, New Jersey. Uh-huh. Not too far from the Garden State. Well, how did it, well, how did it come out? Did the folks go for Terrific. your brand of uh, music? I think it went very well. Unfortunately, there's a little thing in the background that the editor couldn't get out of it. It was on the uh, master, and we couldn't get it out, but... I do uh, wish you'd give it a spin, Bob. Invite your wonderful audience to uh, judge it on their, on their own, and uh, see if they'd well, like. Well, then it. this is going to be somewhat of a first for the Bob and Ray Show. Uh, right. Kind of a, a preview airing of right. the new uh, Society Sound of uh, Barry Campbell. That's what it's called, Barry Campbell at the Debutante Cotillion. At Joe's Bar and Grill. Right. On Route 15, uh-huh. just outside of Bergen, near the Garden State Parkway. Okay. Well, I think we have it set up over there, Joe Alonzo. If we could just hear a, a little bit of it, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the music of Barry Campbell his orchestra and music in the Campbell Manor. And here now is the maestro. Hi, everybody. Uh, I might point out uh, to you that this is a recording being made now that will be available at your record stores shortly. So we hope you'll sit back and enjoy the Barry Campbell Orchestra at the Cotillion Dance. Hey, I wanted a rare steak. This is rare as you're going to get it. You think I'm going to stay out in the kitchen and uh, watch a steak for you all night? You're crazy. i got 12 tables to yeah, take care of this here. This is as tough as shoe leather. Well, you don't mind. I can't eat this. Well, don't pay for it. I wouldn't pay I'm for it. I'm not going to pay for it. Here, take it back. Don't push that plate at me, Miss Oh, yeah? Well, oh, shit. <laughs> I want a red stick.
ladies and gentlemen, it's goodbye from Joe's and goodbye to the music of Barry Campbell and his orchestra. And here's the maestro with a final good night. Well, let's see. Do you have a first aid kit here? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, and I hope you all enjoyed our music and I hope you'll buy the record. Thank you. You've been wonderful. I cut it off, Joe. Uh, is that the whole record, uh, Barry? Well, it's the only uh, seemed to be an awful lot of, of that I brought. confusion there. You could hardly hear the music. Uh -huh. Well, I've had that complaint from everybody who's heard it, so you're not alone in that. Uh, very bad, everyone's noticed it. Very uh, bad editing job mm -hmm. there. Well, he tried to get it out. Uh, and the clarinet player, was something wrong with him? Well, he thought it, uh, it wasn't a real take. He, he thought it was more or less uh, practice. He was trying what they call lip practice on the clarinet. It sounded like he was trying to get real fancy there. What do you think? Uh, it's a beautiful sound I've got there, Bob. It's a sound. Mm. It's a sound. Uh, how about your movie work? Have you... Have you uh... Well, I tried out for the uh, Martin Van Buren role. And uh, they thought I was a little too young-looking to, to play him. Well, you could play Martin in his younger days. Well, they're not going to cover that part of his life. Oh, uh, more or less uh, from the time he was elected president right uh -huh. up until he uh, left office. That's the one they're shooting up in uh, Woodbridge, New Hampshire, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's right, Bob. Oh, uh, I and they've about uh, that. brought over I don't know how many uh, actors uh, from France to uh, portray his cabinet. Uh-huh. Well, I'm sorry that you missed out, <laughs> missed out on the part... But uh, I know you and your band and, of course, the famous trademark, the Barry Campbell Flamingo, will be looked for as you travel around uh, various parts of the country. Be sure and drop in and see us next time you're in town, thank Barry you, Campbell. Thank you, Bob, and uh, thank you, partner. When he gets back, it's always a pleasure to drop in and uh, talk with you boys. I always consider this my second home. Well, you can do that anytime you want, Barry. We'll be glad to see you. No, a time signal. <laughs> well, we don't have uh, too much time for a time signal. We have some uh, some things here that uh, we wanted to uh, remind you. Who's this gentleman standing over there by that microphone? You there? I don't know. What? Uh, well, you're talking into a microphone over there, sir? No, I'm not. Well, uh, sort of voce I am, yes. Sort of what? Sort of voce. Kind of quiet. Like. Oh, I see. Well, what are you saying? I mean, uh, Well, I'm just more or less thinking. It's subliminal advertising. You're an advertising man. That's right, I am, yes. Uh, I have my own agency. Well, then we're happy to welcome Madison Avenue to our well, uh, show this evening. Well, uh, no, uh, actually, uh, our, uh, our office is not on Madison Avenue. We're over in Brooklyn, but we're shooting for Madison oh, Avenue. Oh, it's uh, kind of an off-Madison Avenue agency? Yeah, more have. or less like that. But uh, we think that there's probably a pretty good chance for this. Uh, this subliminal <laughs> stuff where, where they kind of sneak in something. Was that, uh, it's only been tried out on TV, I think. I don't think radio has ever had it. Well, uh, you know, there's a first for everything. I'd be quite curious, uh, except I've been thinking into that microphone uh, since you've been on the air, and I'll be curious to see if uh, you get any mail. If anybody People knows get the message. What, you're, what you're trying to get across yeah. there. Right? Uh, I'll be. I'll leave my card and my phone number here with you, Bob. Uh, right. In case anyone calls up with the message uh, or uh, or writes a card, you'll uh, let me know. All yeah? right, we'll get right in Great. touch with you. Sure. Wonderful. Hello, Bob and Ray. Show. Hey, uh, I don't know if we haven't had any. What? I don't know uh, whether this is the message, uh, uh, but I thought I was getting a message. Uh, you did. That's quick reaction. What did you think he was thinking in, into the microphone there? Well, I had a feeling that uh, somebody is yelling, come out, dinner is ready. Come out, dinner is ready. Well, that may be it. We'll check. He's left now, but we'll uh, we'll check. Hang up the phone. Come out and dinner is ready. Somebody is calling you for dinner, I think. So oh, well, then better I hang said, up. yeah, I'm rock. And we better hang up, too, until tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Until then, this is Ray Goulding reminding you all to write if you get work. Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumbs. Thank you. Thank you. This is the CBS Radio Network. Boy, can you imagine that music in stereo? This here. Yes. It's Thank you, Frenchie. Better. With his theme, Old MacDonald Had a Farm, E-I-E-I-O, once again we introduce the Bob and Ray Director of Agriculture and uh, Farm Topics from the Lackawanna, New York Field Station, Mr. Dean Archer Armstead. Hello, Dean. Hello, Bob. Hello, everyone. Do you have a guest with you today? Bob, this fellow's standing here in overall. Hank Hazelton. Hank, nice to make your acquaintance. Hank, we've been charged of Very nice to know you. Just a second, Hank. Just a second. Hank was in charge of the compost. 
Up at the Lackawanna Station. At the experimental station? Hank, I wonder if we come up here now and uh, explain to Bob and to, uh, to Ray, too, if he cares, uh, and to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, should you put a bell in there? Uh, there is one there, yeah. Well, uh, uh, Hank, there uh, has some very wonderful, interesting thoughts for, uh, for a compost pile, and uh, we have one of the most successful, you know. We use uh, tomato vines. I know you do. We use uh, wood trimming, sawdust, and uh, everything. Well, in the past years, this has uh, worked out very well. I know that uh, experimentally, you began doing this uh, four or five years back. You pine uh, and leaves we use, too. A triple pine, the picture's the best thing in the world, and next spring we'll, we'll put on your flower bed. I would say, uh, deem that, uh, grass... Hank, no, Hank Hazel, ladies and gentlemen. Grass, uh, cuttings, and, uh, any like of that, uh, would be very good in your compost heap. Well, Hank, uh... Grass cuttings, uh, Hank. Hank, uh, could you tell us this? How often should a fellow get out and stir it up? Or, I mean, uh, once well, nature takes over and starts working... We recommend uh, about once every uh, two or three weeks. <laughs> What's the matter with me? Talk's kind of funny. Uh, he's, got a, he's got a funny microphone for me. <laughs> once uh, every two or three weeks, uh, Hank. To stir it up, right? That's about right, yes. Hank Hazel, ladies and gentlemen, and overalls. For nice having you here. Thanks. And uh, we'll bring it back. And if they ever have any purple, 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 purple. And I'm sure Dean will take you back in the station wagon. <laughs> and the compost. Uh, let us know. You're Part still, uh, well. still yeah. doing the early morning show up there, Dean? Yeah, that's right, Bob. Uh, I, I don't know if I can do it this winter, though, because I'm somebody with a freak of a walk around. The what? I've got a lot of clean. I said uh, well, I've got a lot of clean. Yes, we've been listening to Dean Archer Armstead of the Lackawanna, New York Field Station, Robin Ray's on, agriculture man. director. I got it in the right. Uh, uh, Wonderful, wonderful. Just think, all the way down to Lackawanna, and they didn't spend more than three or four minutes. I know. Well, that's uh, part of the expense we go to to present a good program. Yeah, it's so true. Now, Lauren Spechtenberger, interstellar opposite candidate. Right, gang, chocolate cookies with white stuff in between them brings you another episode of Lauren Spechtenberger, Interstellar Officer Candidate. In our last episode, Lauren Spechtenberger, Interstellar Officer Candidate, and his fellow officer candidate, Mug Mellish, had just received sealed orders from the Dean of the Interstellar Space Academy. Now, back in the hangar, we hear Lauren Spechtenberger say... Mellish... I hope you're not going to sneer on this. <laughs> Just open the seal order, Spectenberger. We'll see who sneers. Well, I what do a... they say? Just a moment, Mark. I have a feeling that this is a very important... Hello. Hello. What an important mission this is. What do you mean? I... I can't even tell you, Mellish, where we're headed. Can't tell me? I, I, I'm supposed to go with you on You're going with me, Mellish. But I'm the captain of this tub, remember that. <laughs> That's what the dean said. I can't tell you where we're going until we're, well, several hours away from Earth. I don't get you, Fechtenberger, but I'll follow along so far. Well, here, you can see right in the orders. It says, don't tell Mellish. Here, look for yourself. Yeah, it's written in the dean's handwriting, too. Right. See? What do you know about that? See, we're heading to be... Doesn't say anything about your girlfriend, Jed Ordway. <laughs> Mellish, let me set this straight with you once and for all. Keep Jet Ordway out of this. <laughs> I'm sneering again, Fechtenberger. That's the trouble with you, Mellish. You're going through life sneering. Well, come on. Someday you'll pay and pay dearly for your indifference. Be that Remember, as listen may. and obey, Mellish. For you well, may command. You may command one day. I know. I heard all that, Fechtenberger. All right, let's get aboard. All right. Up we go. I wish I knew where we were going, though. Did you get the screen door? No, I didn't. Good. All right, batten down the lateral stabilizer, please, Mellish. Lateral stabilizer, batten down. Check the overhead ram. What was that? The overhead ram. What do you want me to do with it? Check it, just make oh, sure check. it's aboard. That's all. Right. Let's cut it. <laughs> overhead ram, check. 
Ignition on. Ignition on, Fechtenberger. All right. Close the door. There we are. It's funny. Well, Mellis, let's start. Let's go. I'm trying, Fechtenberger. Some trouble there somewhere. Dirty points or something. Mellish, are you doing this intentionally? <laughs> what makes you think I am, Fechtenberger? Well, this has always started before. And now, on this particular important mission, I'm curious as to why our spaceship <laughs> won't start. Doing my best, Trachtenberger. That's well, all I can say. Everybody start. out. We'll have to report back to the commandant. The dean is sure gonna be upset with you, Trachtenberger. And there you have it, gang. The first episode of Warren Spechtenberger, Interstellar Officer Candidate. Wally Blue is uh, standing by now for a very interesting interview. We Blue about to conduct a very interesting interview. As part of every metropolitan newspaper, there's Hold an away. office where... Hold it, we're not on here yet. Well, oh. I haven't got the go-ahead from uh, Master Control. Well, my timing says we should be on now. I don't care about your timing. No need to talk into a dead All mic. right, Ed's Wait a minute. Go ahead. I just got the go-ahead. We on now? Yeah. We're on the air now. Yeah. Lee Ballou speaking from uh, a large metropolitan newspaper. Your mic was on, Ballou. Well, Look, you, you put me in the saddle about four times on that. That sounds like I'm, I'm uh, upcutting you. Let me help you. tell you here, will you please, George? Well, I'll just cut it out. Don't have very much time. out of uh, we engineers long enough. Peeking from the office Give where questions lift. of all types are answered uh, by people who phone in uh, wanting to know various things. And one of the experts right, here, I think his name is Lester, uh, just put the phone down. Lester, could you tell us a little bit? Bit about the questions that are asked of you here. Uh, well, yes, we get many calls here, Mr. Blue, in the course of a day, uh, not only from those who work on the newspaper, but people uh, who are settling arguments or discussions or one thing or another. I see the light on the phone is blinking. There must be a call coming in. Yes, you want to get that? Hello. Uh, hello, is this the newspaper? Your mic ain't on. <laughs> is this the newspaper? Uh, yes. Uh, how many, uh, how much garbage is tossed out every day in New York City? Oh, wait a minute, I'll, uh... What was the question he was asking? I want to know time? how much garbage is tossed out every day in New York City. Do you have the answer to that? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, we have about a pail every day. Multiply that by about, was it, 8 million people? Yes, approximately. Hello? Yes? About 8 million cans a day uh, probably get thrown out, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Certainly uh, is interesting to see these phones light up and the questions come in. What's the favorite question people ask of you, uh, Lester? Uh, I think the, the most favorite the question is, uh, what's new? A lot of people call and say, what's new? Uh-huh. I what, don't know. What would the second uh, most uh, most frequently asked question be? Uh, well, this week uh, we've had about 4,000 calls uh, about, is it true that only four hairs on the chin of a badger are suitable for a fine... Uh, Expensive shaving brush. I see. Very interesting. True, and, uh, incidentally. Our thanks uh, for letting us come behind the scenes of a large uh, newspaper here. This is Ollie Ballou, attorney. As a sustaining feature of the Bob and Ray Show, we bring you another episode of One Fella's Family. Today's episode, entitled Prowlers Upstairs, is taken from book CLVII, chapter IXIII. It's shortly after 9 p.m. in the evening as we find mother and father sitting in the den downstairs. Father is reading the newspaper. Mother is standing just inside the door, and we hear... Yes, Andy? Yes? See, here where they've... They've noted there's prowlers in the neighborhood again. Well, I saw that in the paper, too. Yes. They were seen over at the Watsons' house just last week. Really? Yes. Now, the Watsons were away, and they didn't even tell the newsboy not to deliver papers. Yes. The milkman kept coming, too. I mean, they broadcast the fact that they were yeah. going to be away. Yeah, the weather has turned cold. 
just oh, a yeah, while back. Nothing yet, but it was just I mean, like the uh, like summer. Look at lugs some of this furniture out there. Pretty old, good antiques, but yes. I don't see any good brooches or diamonds or anything like Forecasters that. Forecasters for good weather Small tomorrow, things. though. Yes. Do you have the radio on? They'll hear us downstairs. Uh, what's that, Fanny? Do you have the radio on? No, no. Thought I had radios voices. in the kitchen. Thought I heard voices. Now we're getting a little more. Uh, Mm. Oh, you're hearing things, then. Well, now, that dog I heard. Uh, whose dog is that? It's anyway? the Watson's watchdog. Well, a fine watchdog he yeah, is to have uh, yes. their house for uh, <laughs> What's that, Betty? I said he must be a poor watchdog. Who? Watson's. Nothing. Watson's not a watchdog. Oh, well, Watson's dog. Is I thought you said that that yeah. they had a yeah. watchdog. You know, I believe that I hear prowlers upstairs in our own house. Yeah. Well, it stands to reason if they hit the Watsons, they'd hit us next. Is it played or yeah. See here where the yeah. where the dentists are going to have a convention in town this month. Yeah. They uh, they were here a few years ago, I think. Yes. Yeah. Fine time they had, too. They have a good time. Well, you know, it's like the old joke. They like to get away because they're down in the mouth so much. Fanny, Fanny, Fanny. I think I read that in one of those magazines. It's a joke sent in. The person got $5. Yeah. yeah. Did you drop something, Fanny? No. No, I think it's getting... Wait, I'm going out the kitchen get time. some cupcakes or something. I'll meet you out the car. Time for me to go, uh, go to bed, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I believe I'll stay up and read a little longer. Well, I'll be sure now and uh, and uh, put out the lights. You want any cupcakes? Yeah. No, you come upstairs. Come All right. Get out the car. Be right out. Okay. Leave the light on. I will. Just yeah. hope that... Uh, that we don't have any problem with the prowlers upstairs. Yes. You have been listening to One Fellow's Family. Brought to you as a sustaining feature on the Bob and Ray Show. Today's episode, entitled Prowlers Upstairs, was taken from book CLVII, chapter IX, IIII. One Fellow's Family is written and produced by T. Wilson Messy. This is a Messy production. Once again, it's time for Grand Motel, a speck of a place, a heck of a place on Route 14 near Hadleyville where the mountains reach the sky and living is as easy as pie. And once again, we find uncompromising owner and general manager, Leonard Humphrey, out front. All right, all right, I'm coming. Stop blowing the horn. Come start it, the vibration cracked the ink well on the front desk. Hey, uh, mister... What are your rates here? What are the rates? Let's go. Well, eh, first let me introduce myself. I'm Leonard Humphrey, owner and general manager of Grand Motel. Oh, well, that's fine. Uh, now, uh, what are your rates? You can have a cabin for dollar seventy-five the day. Uh, it's a little steep, Humphrey. Do I get any services thrown in with it? Yeah. You get a free continental breakfast consistent of donuts and coffee. And, uh, what time do you serve the continental breakfast, Humphrey? Well, I mean... Wait a minute, Dad, Dad. Wait, oh. wait a minute, wait till I get there. Now, don't tell him what time you serve the breakfast. <laughs> All right, Neil. Say, Humphrey, uh, what's a swell-looking girl doing in a dump like this? She's my daughter. Dad, did you tell him what time we serve the continental breakfast? Not yet, Naomi. Well, thank heavens for that. Now, listen, Dad, we can't afford to lose another customer, so serve the Continental Breakfast whenever he wants it. Yeah. Remember, we need the money for advertising purposes. All right, Naomi, I'll serve it whenever he wants it. Hey, Alfred, I asked you a question. I never got an answer. Well, the Continental Breakfast will That's be served... That's not the question I want an answer to. Come on, now. Come on. I asked you before, what's a swell-looking girl like that doing in a dump like this? She's my daughter. Okay. 
Now, what time's the continental breakfast served? Any time you want it. All right, I'm free. Let's see. Now, I want to fly out here. Pretend to be back. I'm going to gamble till about one in the morning and fly. See, I should be back here, Humphrey. Uh, I want the free continental breakfast at four in the morning. All right. You can have the continental breakfast at four in the morning. That's more like it, Dad. Everything's under control here, Naomi. You better change the blotter on the front desk. Say, Humphrey, uh, suppose I get back from uh, Vegas an hour early. Can I have the continental breakfast at three? Well, I suppose I can relax the rules a little bit. Yes, you can have the continental breakfast at three. Wait a minute, Humphrey. What kind of a place is this? I don't like the idea of relaxed rules. I'll bet you relax all kinds of rules around now, here. Now, you wait a minute, sir. Take your hand off the brake. Release and... Take your hand off the brake, release, and listen. No, sir. Who knows what kind of a bad place this is. So long, Humphrey. Oh, shucks. Wait till Naomi hears about this. Can Leonard Humphrey take much more of this and remain solvent? Is advertising the answer to the problem? Be with us again soon as another car pulls up to Grand Motel. Word Carr is out in Hollywood right now. Uh, He's talking with, you remember Barry Campbell, the famous movie star who's appeared on our show numberless times. Uh, He is out there now filming the new uh, movie, If Pain Persists. And uh, Word Carr is standing by now, all set to interview uh, Barry on the set. Come in, please. Word Carr. Thank you, Bob and Ray. Word Carr speaking on the set of If Pain Persists. And I'm talking with Barry Campbell, the star of the picture. And in just a moment, we're going to watch one of the crucial scenes uh, being shot. Barry, this is the uh, charge of the cavalry uh, scene, I believe. Oh, that's right. I Uh, see all of the horses and the extras are lined up over there. Well, this, uh, the extras, uh, number about 1,100 uh, is a tremendous cavalry charge here. Certainly and, an expensive uh, scene we're about to see uh, put on film. That's right. I'm, uh, I'm a lieutenant in the uh, fifth field flank of this, uh, this particular cavalry outfit. Stand by, everybody. Oh, I, I'm going to... Get those extras <laughs> over there with them horses. We're going to shoot a... Everybody go when I say go. We have a... Uh, a uh, rather important uh, scene right now. A lot of action, very little to be said. All right, said. Barry, well, you just uh, go over and we'll follow right. with our right. microphone and listen. Uh, ready on the set. All you extras and horses ready? Talk! Speak! Action! Camera! I knew your father, Ferguson. You're the first Ferguson in the fifth field flank to fail to fulfill the fundamental functions of a field flank front runner. Truly, truly, that's a lawfully free group of... Cut! Uh, Hold uh, it. Get the horses back. Sorry, I'm sorry. That's okay, uh, Campbell. We uh, don't make mistakes. We'll try it again. Tongue twister. Uh, all right. You got all the horses lined up for the other side? The extras... Horses are okay, yeah. Talk. Speak. Action. Camera. So take... I knew your father, Ferguson. You're the first Ferguson in the field flag to fail to fulfill the fundamental functions of a field flag front runner. Well, Frisbee, that's a fragrant. Uh, uh, cut! Uh, cut! Hey, look, come on, uh, Campbell. Well, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, well, we... once we'll get the extras and the horses back see, there. See, I say, Colonel Frisbee, that's a <laughs> filthy, fragrant falsehood. All you say is, Colonel Frisbee, that's a filthy, flagrant falsehood. Bob and Ray. All right. Bob and Ray's announcer. Action. Turn it back to New York right away. <laughs> this is Word Car, returning it to New York. And back here just in time, too. Gee, that was exciting. I Until tomorrow. The end of that. This is Sergeant Ben Royster, and this is your Army Amateur Program. Today, coming to you from the huge hangar at Linlacker Air Base here in Linlacker, Wyoming. And I see that the last planes have been pushed out of the hangar, and so it's time for our first contestant. He's Seaman First Class. 
Alan Shripshade. Hi, Alan. Hello, Sergeant. Alan, I noticed by your insignia that you're a submariner. What are you doing in these parts? Well, I'm afraid that's classified information, Sergeant. Oh, uh-huh. Uh, I can tell you this, uh, Linlac Air Base is going to be the new secret testing site for submarine missiles. Though. Well, glad to have the Navy out here, sailor, and... Now, uh, what talent do you bring to our armed services microphone today? Well, uh, Sergeant, it's not uh, exactly me. It's uh, my cat, Ned. Your cat? Well, whatever talent the cat has, of course, you fostered, didn't you? Oh, well, sure. Well, I guess it counts, then, just as much as if you had the talent yourself, which makes you eligible for the coveted Drill Talent Award. Uh, Just what does your cat do, uh, Seaman? Uh, Well, uh, I pour milk on piano keys, Uh and uh, then I put Ned... On the key, see? And yes. And by voice command, I can get them to run wherever I want them on to. On the keyboard, you mean? That's right. And I can get them to play a lot of tunes that way. Well, that sounds like a wonderful bit of talent your cat has. And uh, what do you say we give a listen to it? Here is a cat on a milk-covered keyboard playing a tune by virtue of voice commands given by Seaman First Class Alan Shripshade. All right, now this way, Ned. Come on, come on, Ned. That's it. Back it up, Ned. Hey, back. Now over here on the black keys. That's it. Down here now. Step on these two. That's it. Quick, come on. Got to hurry. Come on, up here, Ned. That's the way, baby. All right, come on. Back down here now. Oh, you're doing fine, Ned. Good boy, Ned. Up here now. Hit these. Oh, <laughs> Oh, careful there. <laughs> now, he got his clock off between uh, B-flat and... Uh, Too bad, but uh, uh, pretty good, even so, uh, Seaman First Class Alan Tripshade, and I think we'll see you at the semifinals. And now, glad to get my card here. It shows that an Army nurse, Lieutenant Jane Wamby, is next on our Armed Forces Talent Parade. Hello, Lieutenant. Glad you could make it out here to Linlacker, Wyoming. Well, I'm glad I could, too. I'm stationed at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, so the trip wasn't much, really. Are you uh, thrilled to be here, Lieutenant? Yes, it's a definite thrill to be here, especially for me. Well, Lieutenant, it's time right now for you to show us what you can do and just what is it you do, Lieutenant? Well, I I made up a greeting card in the shape of a small box. Well, that's not very good talent. Well, I attached a specially treated string to the card, so when I pull the string... I uh, reproduce my own voice. All right, then. Here is Army Lieutenant Jane Wamby reproducing her own voice with a string attached to a greeting card. Go to it, Lieutenant. Hello? This is Lieutenant Jane Wamby. How are you do out there? It's a thrill for me to be here. How do you Goodbye. Wonderful. Just wonderful, Lieutenant. With that talent, you certainly should be a finalist for the Drill Talent Award. Leave your name with Corporal Mansfield, will you? Thank you. I'm thrilled. So are we, Lieutenant Jane Wamby, and this is Sergeant Ben Royster bidding you goodbye from the hangar here at Linlacker Air Base. <laughs> Wally Blue just called up. He's downstairs. He is? Yeah. Okay, uh, so that would mean that we'll have a Wally Blue report from the street. Engineer, is he all set? Good. All right, come in, please. Wally Ballou. This is Ballou. I'm standing here, one of the main thoroughfares of Manhattan, about to chat with some of the many visitors who are streaming into our fair city to enjoy the sights and the activity of New York in the summertime. New York, as you may have heard, a summer festival. We're standing here amidst a crowd of uh, interesting visitors, and I think I'd like to chat maybe with this gentleman uh, right here to my left. How do you do? It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to talk to you people. Where would your home be, sir? My home would be in Pendleton, Oregon. My name is... Portland, Oregon? Pendleton. Pendleton. My name is Hank Bauer. (laughs) Very nice to uh, talk with you, Hank, if I may call you that. Please, everyone does. Uh... How long have you been here in the New York? Uh, this is your vacation, I presume. No, I came here in 1916. Oh, well, then you're rather familiar with the uh, ways of uh, a big oh, yeah. city like well, this. Well, I've been here, let's see, 26 would be 10, 36, 20, 46, 30, 56, 40. I've been here 43 years. Uh-huh. Well, now, of course, it always occurs to a man of the street interviewer that, right, get that off. the important thing to... Talk about in an interview is something exciting. Is there yeah. anything uh, yeah. with you that we could discuss? That... Well, uh, I don't know. 
know, maybe. So I, I had a very interesting discussion just this morning with a, uh, with a friend of mine uh, who is, has a very interesting hobby, uh, Mr. Ballou. He's an egg camper. And uh, he uh, was explaining to me that the... Uh, That's a, wonderful. Go ahead. A, a trained person can take a, uh, an egg and, uh, and hold it up hold it up to a light and uh, he can tell, uh, you know, whether that egg is good or has a double yolk or... Uh, How long does it take to, to do that? Well, uh, egg candle is there. Uh, it's, a, it's a highly trained, uh, trained uh, profession, I guess you'd call it. Uh, do you need any particular education for it? No, I think training, uh, more or less. And uh, what you do is uh, uh, you hold the egg up to the candle. Uh-huh. See? And uh, I, Wonderful. Think, I think he can do a dozen eggs in maybe ten minutes, which is uh, slower. It's almost like one and a quarter egg or one and a third egg or so. Per second? Per second, uh-huh. which is, uh, per, yeah, per second. I think that's... Uh, well, oh, I'm not... Out of an average, uh, we'll say, uh, ten dozen eggs, I guess that wall most how many would you think uh, they'd have yeah. to uh, throw out? One company will be enough. The average cat here, Lieutenant. I'll keep company, too. You take uh, your man back. Cut it. How cut many it. would you... Cut it. Looks to me like Wally Ballou has missed himself a scoop down Something there. Something was going on down there, wasn't I it? I couldn't quite make out, uh, <laughs> but that was very interesting indeed. I wish we had more time to go on with it, but oh, we, we don't, call unfortunately. Him again, maybe he has spotted the uh, the news story that's there. Could we go back All right, let's, the street? Uh, let's try Are we it. equipped to do that, engineer? Let's see. Engineer's lining up now, yeah. And you mean that uh, there wouldn't be more than five or six out of... That's what it would average out to be, five eggs out of a hundred... Cut it, engineer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, then, let's see. Oh, uh, it's time now to present Jack Headstrong, isn't it? All-American American. Hmm? Jack Headstrong. Oh, wait a second. All right. Jack Headstrong. 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 All-American American. All American. Jack, Billy, Uncle Jim, and Betty are busily at work at Jack's laboratory on his new transistorized blimp that operates on two regular flashlight batteries. The government, of course, is hoping he will finish it on schedule, but it doesn't look as though he will, as we hear Jack say. All right, just a second now, Uncle Jim. I have just one tiny adjustment to make, and then All we right, can... Jack, can I help you in any way? Quiet, Uncle Jim. There's no time for that Jack, now. I think I've seen Billy, five quiet, around. please. There's quiet, no Billy. Quiet, quiet Uncle Jack. Jim. Quiet, Billy. There's no time for that but now. Jack, spies... Quiet, the... Billy. Just Go a few ahead, moments. Jack. Quiet, Jim. Just a few moments. We'll be able to put air in this blimp. See if it works. Just think. Uh, Billy, quiet. Billy, there's no time for that now. They are letting your mind run away with you, Billy. Who are those people skulking in the parking lot? I have no idea, Jack, but you've got Billy? to finish this blimp on time. Billy? Yes, Jack? Go out and see who they are. Yeah, Report can I back to me immediately. Out to say? Yes, Jack. hurry. Jim, quiet before you say anything. There's no time for it now. I wasn't going to say anything, Jack. Now, I want to install the air in this blimp and see if it's... can go in the air. Hand me the flashlight battery. Yes, here you are. You think this will work, Jack, on two simple batteries? Quiet, Uncle Jim. Quiet, Uncle Jim. I'm trying to listen. Two pounds. Three pounds. Four. Five. Jack, I went out. Quiet, and didn't see Billy. Anything. There's no time for that now. Quiet, Billy. Eight, nine, ten, twelve. Four, I don't think eight. it'll work, Quiet, Jack. Billy. What seems to be the trouble, Jack? The air is escaping from the blimp. There's something wrong with it here, Jim. Maybe the spies got hold of it, Jim. Quiet, Billy. There's no time for that nonsense now. Well, it's off to Washington. Goodbye. And a few hours later in the Octagon building in Washington. Quiet, General. There's no time for that now. I'm All here right. on a very important mission. Go ahead, Headstrong. Now, as you know, I've been commissioned uh, by the SBI, that's the Special Bureau of Investigation, to yes. come here with and explain to you about my blimp, my transistorized blimp. Well, you're going to try and go around the world Just a moment, in Four Star days. General, I'm not through. Oh, I'm sorry, Headstrong. My plan, General, is to go around the world uh, in this blimp and uh, see if it's practical for world travel. 
Well, it's certainly a good experiment, uh, Headstrong, but you've got to start by Monday. By Monday, sir? That's right, if we had to keep on schedule. Well, that's a practical impossibility, sir. I... Placing all of our hopes on you, Headstrong. You'd better come through. Well, then there's nothing else to do but return home. I'll be airborne by Monday. Good luck, Headstrong. Thank you, sir. So Jack heads back to his laboratory, assured that by Monday he will take off in his transistorized blimp. Be sure and join us next time when we'll hear Jack say... Uncle Jim, I feel sick. In the next episode of Jack Headstrong, All-American American. Our good friend, Word Carr, was interviewing Barry Campbell out in Hollywood, where they're on location somewhere close to Hollywood, filming the new movie, the big extravaganza entitled, If Pain Persists. Uh, you'll recall also that the broadcast was cut short so that we, uh, we couldn't get it all in. So today, we're going right straight back. They've had a night now of rest. They're back... Shooting all day today, though. They have been shooting all day. Yeah. This, uh, this uh, are you having trouble with uh, your headphones? I want to hear the program, and I can't. Well, I'm going to put on my headphones, and uh, I had that pair the other day. Yeah, that's... the kind that keeps snapping off your head and go down to the audience. I'm <laughs> sorry, lady. And uh, there. Ah, that's much better. And uh, he's standing by now, so I think. A uh, word can answer any questions that will be in your mind anyway. So come in, please. Word Carr. Word Carr speaking. They're ready now to resume shooting on If Pain Persists. Take 75 is just about to uh, get underway. Barry Campbell has spent the night going over his lines. And uh, the Colonel actor Frisbee. who will play the colonel has... Uh, perhaps you can hear Barry in the background as colonel he... Colonel Frisbee, does a, that's a filthy... Fragrant falsehood. As he goes over a last minute check of the line that he will speak to the colonel after the onrush of the cavalry uh, by the colonel's tent. Colonel I see Frisbee, the director now is filthy. getting all the extras, the grips, uh, and the horses ready at one end of this uh, area that's been roped <coughs> off. A uh, scene like this, I was told by the director, costs $20,000 every time the camera rules. And they've reloaded the film. Stand by. Fourteen times. There's the signal to stand by. Speak. Now you hear the scene being shot. Speak. Cut. Hold it. Hold it. I didn't say action. Camera ready. Colonel Frisbee. That's a filthy, fragrant song. Speak. Speak. Action. Action. I knew your father, Ferguson. You're the first Ferguson in the fifth field flank to fail to fulfill the fundamental functions of a field flank front runner. Colonel Filthy, that's a fragrant. So oh. It's not Colonel Filthy, Campbell. I know it. Colonel sir. Frisbee, now. Colonel Frisbee, that's a. We've fil- done this thing 75 it's times. It's a tongue twister. Get the horses back there. Get the extras over the other side. Everyone back. Back up the hill. Back up the arroyo. Now, folks, look. I know this is uh, kind of a tough scene. Uh, I know you've been working all day on it, but we've got to get it before the sun goes down. Look, uh, I'm a nervous wreck, sir. Uh, Is there some You're a pretty bum actor, too, Campbell. (laughs) That's beside the point now. It's... To me, this is impossible. It's a, it's a tongue twister, a spoonerism that I just cannot uh, utter. Look, Campbell, all yes. you say is, Colonel, Colonel Frisbee, Frisbee, that's a filthy, flagrant falsehood. Let me hear you say it. Colonel Frisbee, that's a filthy, flagrant falsehood. Right. Now, what's so difficult about that, Campbell? I don't know what it is. The minute they, I see right. the camera... All right, rolling. just a minute. What's that? I say, the minute I see the cameras rolling, I don't know. It, it's just the combination of flagrant and fragrant and falsehood. Well, somehow. That's the and way it's, it's written, uh, Campbell. Can we change the colonel's name? I want to try this just once more. <laughs> you don't get it this time, or we'll rewrite the thing. Okay. All right, extras ready. Horses ready. Speak. Speak. This is take 76. Action. Action. (laughs) 
I knew your father, Ferguson, and you're the first Ferguson in the fifth field flank to fail to fulfill the fundamental functions of a field flank front runner. Closely, Filthy. This is a fragrant hey. friend. John, uh, Filthy. You're right, uh, Campbell. We got a the fault. Uh, Bring that losses back. I can't even say my name now, Director. It's impossible. I tell you what we do. All right, quiet down now. Not Every, so funny. Everybody's under a strain. <laughs> Uh, I do see the humor in it. About a million dollars worth of goofs here, and they're all yeah. laughing. We got time for about one more take. How about if if you start the scene, uh, Campbell? Oh yeah. Come in and say something like, uh, "Do you call for me, Colonel Frisbee?" Or uh, I think maybe that would do it. I'd come in rather than uh, the Colonel speaking first. I'd say, right. "Did you want to see me, Colonel Frisbee?" Then he could give that speech. That's what I was thinking. All right. I think uh, yeah. you got that, uh, Colonel. Uh-huh. Yes. All right. Fine. Okay. Everybody ready? Take 77. All the horses back on the field right here. Talk. Speak. Action. Action. Camera. Did you want to see me, Colonel Frisbee? Good. Wonderful, Campbell. Oh, good. What are you doing, Colonel? Well, I'm sorry. I, I just, I just completely forgot. I was so surprised at uh, a clean, straight line coming out of Campbell there. <laughs> well, uh, I'm sorry. My apologies, uh, Campbell, for ruining your scene. It's all right, uh, Director. Should we do it once more, or? Well, I guess we better knock off for the day. We'll finish it off tomorrow. All right. I'm this ashamed. is Word Car again. I'm going to try to get a few words from Barry Campbell before returning it to you, Bob and Ray, in New York, so don't take it away yet. Barry, Barry, over yeah. here for the radio. Oh, hi. Hi. It's... Had rather a trying day, didn't you? Trying is uh, broadly the, uh, the... Radley the... Uh, the, uh, the uh, I, I noticed... Uh, hardly the, uh, the uh, word... Uh, You're uh, having uh, trouble with your lines. Do you think uh, it'll be any easier in the morning? Well, possibly, uh, possibly, possibly, uh, you know, maybe with a, a right's nest. Uh, it'll be all right. What? A night's uh, oh, yeah. sleep. Well, you'd better uh, get a good night's rest. Right. And uh, we'll be back here on the set tomorrow morning. Good. And now, this is... I am truly, really, really gabbed, or uh, gasped. This is Word Car, returning it now to New York. Thank you, Word. That would really be something to see when they get that scene finished, if they ever do, huh? Yes, but I don't think we'll go back out there again, do you? I don't think so. For your pleasure, we present part one of the Bob and Ray two-part drama to be concluded with part two next week. And now, part one. All right, all right, so I did it. I got nothing to be ashamed of. My house is clean. Is yours? That's not the point, Jerry. Have you told anyone about this? Ted Wilson. You told Ted Wilson? Well, why shouldn't I have, George? Of all the people, not to tell. Jerry, don't you know Wilson's reputation? He's the biggest thief on the street. There isn't a man who trusts him. He's a swindler, a cheat, a liar. Jerry, Ted Wilson's strictly no good. And look... Hold, uh, hold, hold it, Ray. <clears throat> this isn't part one of our two-part drama. Oh, it sounds more like part two, doesn't it? Yeah. Part one starts with a scene at a cocktail party. I remember that. All right, well, we'd better take it from the top, the cocktail party. All right. Once again, part one of the Bob and Ray two-part drama to be concluded with part two next week. Are you all having fun, dears? I am. I think I'm going to kick off my shoes, let down my hair. Betty, don't you think Amanda is going at it a little too hard, a bit too fast, perhaps? I think so, Don. I'm worried, too. She looks a little schizoid, if you ask me. Well, I don't think that, Betty. Amanda's too right, self-sufficient so. to have that happen. She's just a bit too mature to fall into a typical schizoid pattern. I'd say she was paranoid, though. Well, that's how much you know. Well, let me tell you. Uh, excuse me. Which is the hostess? I'd like to pay my respects to her. Uh, uh, she's over there. I'll call her. Amanda! There's an available male over here who wants to meet you. Well, thank you very much. So you're the famous Amanda Potter. Guilty, kind sir. Forgive me, but I've been watching you from across the room. Your your face. 
elsewhere, it's, it's like a shaft of sunlight, so cheerful. I'm an artist, and I'd like you to sit for me. Uh, certainly, Amanda. Get me a chair. Oh, what a fabulous sense of humor you have. I feel <laughs> as though I've known you a lifetime, and yet I don't even know your name. Ted Wilson's the name. Well, wait a minute. Isn't there more to part one, Bob? Yes, but uh, we started on part two, and it ate into the time that we had for the whole thing, see? Well, uh, what will we show next week? Well, the folks just heard the opening of part two and a good portion of part one. Well, then we'll have to complete the end of part one and pick up the middle of part two, right? Right-o, and it's going to happen here next week on the Bob and Ray two-part drama. <laughs>